I already forgot what you wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, that doesn't count. I haven't sent the message yet. Stop it. <laughs> I'm sending the message now. Hello everyone, Evan from Monkey DM here. Laura Bailey is an amazing voice actress. She's taken part in many video games, for example as Jaina Proudmoore. But where I discovered her the most, and I'm sure many of you did, is in Critical Role as Vexalia and now more recently Jester. Massive spoilers of Critical Role campaign 2 ahead. Throughout the campaign she managed to create one of the most memorable character of the whole cast. How did she do that? Well, that's what we're gonna go into today. So stay tuned for that. And there's quite a few lessons to take away from this that you can apply to your own D&D games. First, she's the heart of the party. The Mighty Nine at first is a bunch of edgy kids who lie to themselves a lot, looking at Caleb, for example, or not. Jester is very apart from that. She's pure joy. She's happy, she's cheerful, there's always something going on that's great, or so she says. And she shares that joy to the other party members. She is a constant source of laughter, encouragement, and so much more. And not only does she believe in herself, she believes in the other party members, which they do not do themselves. Well, as you can imagine, the whole cast takes a liking to her because she's this constant source of positive, reinforcement. It's not so much that she's a pillow to come and cry on, but really that she's always trying to find solutions to the problems that the various party members have. Sure, her solutions might include drawing dicks, which is not exactly helpful, but she's really trying to find some way of making them feel better. And for that very reason, everybody likes her. Jester has established herself as the heart of the party. And part of me is morbidly curious to know what would have happened if she were to die because the mighty nine would have been very different without this source of joy and positivity in the crew i'm not calling them murder hobos by any means but i'm just saying that if chester were to die it could have been an option she is the spark of joy in this group of depressed emo kids no not you caduceus Get out the frame, you know you're not included. Now, how does she roleplay Joy? Extremely well, that's how she does it. And notably in the first few episodes, she has this childlike happiness. If you've ever watched a kid, they have like those big bright eyes and they just stare at you and they're so happy to see you. And you know it's true happiness because they don't have any hidden motives and Jester is very much like that. She's just this pure force of joy and laughter and it's so refreshing to see. She does it in a more mature way of course because she's an adult but you can see that most of the time her motives are not hidden. She's very open about her intentions and that is so refreshing in a life of scheming and plotting. Although she does hide some things, which we'll talk about later in the video, you see the innocence in her in the way that, for example, most of her pranks aren't meant to harm people or hurt them, but genuinely to try and bring a laugh to everyone. What did I, what do you mean? You said, you said, mom and dad, I hope that it make you proud. Oh, don't disappoint me. And I don't disappoint you and stuff, and also, she wears, I should probably take a bath more often. <laughs> That's not, that was not that part. <laughs> we were going to say that and then the great thing went into you. So yes, Jester is the best support. Not only because she's a cleric, but also because she's an amazing emotional support. Now, when I say that Laura Bailey and Jester is an anomaly, it's also because her backstory is kind of... Let's call it intriguing. Usually the ND backstories involve some sort of drama or sadness or something that is so deeply affecting the character that they felt the need to go on an adventure. Perhaps is to take revenge because a loved one was slaughtered. Maybe it's to be able to help their village because everybody's starving. They usually have a very strong reason to go adventuring. Jester is a bit different in that regard, in the sense that she went on an adventure, but the way she was raised was a very sheltered kid. Laura took what was essentially a sheltered and spoiled kid 
and made it into something lovable. The reason she's adventuring in the first place is not some grand role of saving the world. Granted, most adventures don't start like this, but it's just to find her father. And the reason she's on the road in the first place is because she got kicked out of the chateau because, well, she locked a noble on a balcony in his underwear. And turns out the noble was powerful and asked for her head on a pike. So that will give you a good reason to move. She takes that shelter kid idea and really builds upon it. Kids who are very protected tend to act out because they want the attention. I mean, I would know. I grew up as one. Sorry, mom, I swear I didn't mean to end up at the hospital. What shelter kids also provide is that they have a very unique outlook on the world because they didn't get to explore it. So we have Jester who has those eyes of wonder. She gives me this very Harry Potter vibe. He was raised very sheltered and hidden from everything. So everything is new and exciting to him, especially regarding magic. Does that remind you of someone? Sure, Jester wasn't imprisoned by horrible godparents, but her mom did hide her away from the public eye because she didn't want people to know about the kid of the courtesan, which would be bad for business. That doesn't mean her mother didn't raise her with love. Jester herself says it, and we see it in the show. There's definitely love there, maternal love. But Jester is very relatable to us as the audience because of this fish out of water aspect. She's amazed by everything. Everything is brand new, grandiose and fantastic. And it is, especially for us as the audience. D&D, one of the reasons it's so freaking awesome is because, well, I can't really cast fireballs in real life. Otherwise, I can tell you I wouldn't have neighbors. <sighs> in D&D, you can. And you get to explore all these cool things that you couldn't do in real life. And Jester is that. She's just amazed by everything. And we relate to that. Sure, you don't need to implement that in your own D&D game. I mean, you probably don't have an audience watching and your friends are playing D&D with you, so there's no one who needs to relate. But it's a very fun trait to have. And this whole amazement and wonder plays with her innocent side, because Jester, although she does many of mischief, is also a very innocent person at heart. I mean, Fjord was her first kiss. She never had many experiences before going out in the real world. And that innocence tricks everybody, myself and Matthew Mercer included. You might be wondering how. Well, remember the cupcake incident? Have we a tea? As she oh. leans forward. Well, hold on. Maybe before we make the deal, I can eat one last cupcake. You know, since I won't be able to do it. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to pull out. My last blueberry cupcake. <laughs> Will you split this cupcake with me? Have you ever had a blueberry cupcake? Mm, I don't believe I have. See, I'm using my fingers to break it in half. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Make a persuasion check. <laughs> Twenty-four. She reaches out and grabs the other half of the cupcake. It's so small in her long oh. early fingers. Kind of. That was sprinkled with the dust of deliciousness. <laughs> okay. Remind me what that is again. That is. A dust that makes food taste much better. <laughs> and it also gives you a disadvantage on wisdom checks and wisdom saving throws. Okay. And I'm going to cast Modify Memory. Oh my god. Hold on. Hold on. My hurt slow, but... Oh. <laughs> okay. Oh, no. Okay. Mm-hmm, 
Okay. Did I succeed? Yep. <gasps> what? I'm going to make her believe mm-hmm. that she enjoyed my company so very much that she agreed to end Knot's curse because she liked hanging out so much. <laughs> And she hasn't had good company in a very long time. <laughs> Laura fucking So yeah, the cute jester that we all know and love tricked everybody, Matt Mercer, as the hag, and I'm pretty sure Matt Mercer himself, into eating that cupcake. And I remember watching that episode and my jaw freaking dropped when I realized what just happened. She did what she does best and she played a little prank. But thankfully, she plays a horrible archetype in a very nice fashion. What do I mean by that? Well, if I tell you about a spoiled kid, I'm pretty sure not positives come to mind. Usually spoiled kids tend to be in books, fantasy, media, and sometimes in real life, absolutely horrendous to be around, self-righteous pricks that nobody wants to be around. Take a look at Tyrion Darrington, for example, when he was first introduced. Not only was he disliked because Scanlan just left, but he was also disliked because, well, let's be honest, he was kind of a pompous prick at first. And Jester, although in the later episodes we don't see it anymore, but at first, yeah, she was born a rich kid and she shows it. For example, when she asks her mother for money and the money isn't there and Caleb offers some and she basically spits at it. Also, I don't have any money. That's okay. <laughs> I have a little bit of money. Do you need some? No, I, have I mean, about I fifty have... gold. Do you want me to I give you some? That's about as much as I have now. It's so stupid, though. That's a lot of money. It's not, Caleb. It is. It's not. <laughs> That's more money than my parents ever made in their entire life. That's what I made like every day for my <laughs> allowance. <laughs> In full view of Jester, I reach into my pocket and take what's left of the mud. Just... Oh! oh. And I storm off towards our Okay, love, I didn't mean to... Shit. She's so bloody rich that she rejects a fortune for regular people. Spoiled kid much? But although she does have some aspects of that archetype in her character, it's not so much that it's obnoxious and that you can't stand to have her around. Otherwise, well, I'm pretty sure Critical Role Campaign 2 wouldn't have been as enjoyable. So if you need to take something from this is that you can, in your own characters, take aspects which are not so pleasant for everybody, you know, aspects which are more annoying. But if you do it well enough, it just adds this uniqueness to the character. Just don't overdo it, otherwise everybody's gonna want to murder you. But because of Jester's good nature, we forgive her for those incidents. And I think that's the best way to do those kind of archetypes. So yes, it might be considered annoying, but because she does it so well, we forgive her. And I think that's, if you want to play an archetype similar, this is how you should go about it. Now, one last important thing about Jester is that she doesn't become a cliche. What do I mean by that? Well, characters, when they're part of shows which take a long time, for example, three years to complete, such as Critical Role, what may happen to them is what we call flanderization, where characters become a caricature of themselves. For example, Flander in The Simpsons, who was just supposed to be a good guy and was religious just to emphasize that part where he was a good guy, over the course of the multiple seasons, just became overzealously religious to a point where he was insufferable and that's the only defining characteristic of his character. Jester could have easily become that, for example, by being happy all the time or drawing all the time. But thankfully, she doesn't do so. Her character has enough complexity that it doesn't become a cliche. And what do I mean by enough complexity? Well, although she's joyful the vast majority of the time and she always is playing little pranks, she also has this depth to her. Those things that affect her and hurt her, just like every other human on earth. 
or tiefling for that matter. Despite all that joy, Jester has issues of her own. For example, she's extremely close to the Traveler, which she views as a father figure, her own father being absent while she grew up. So when she feels like the Traveler abandoned her or didn't protect her, she's deeply affected to the point of tears. Do you like me again? I was never disappointed in the first place, Jester. The hood still obscuring most of the face, just the lower jaw and mouth visible. Why didn't you come? I did. I didn't see you. So you're telling me Jester has daddy issues? So yeah, despite that, Jester does get sad, she gets emotional, she gets scared, for example. When Trent Ticketon is chasing after them and she realized that she let slip who her mother was, she is scared for her mom, as any child who cares about their mom would be. And that just makes her so much more human. She's just not this piece of joy who's happy all the time. She's also a human person with real fears. And I think that's a great lesson. You don't let your party know everything about you from the get-go. That's what Jester does, right? From the get-go, she's just this happy person. But as the story progresses and they get closer, that's when she reveals the things that move her and affect her. And I think that's a great way to handle a D&D character, to add depth and complexity to it and avoid it becoming a cliche. I'll end the video by saying this. Similar for Jester, always check on your happy friends because you may never know what's going on inside there. Take care, everyone.